views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello, welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm Darren Jaime, and today we're going to update you on what's happening in and around our borough. Coming up on today's show, we'll give you the latest news in the world of politics. Afterwards, Halloween season might be over and Thanksgiving, but New Yorkers are kicking off the New York City Horror Film Festival. Stay tuned for details as one of BronxNet's hosts is actually involved. And after that, if you have loved ones that depend on you, then you need life insurance. We'll give you some tips for buying a life insurance policy. So we want you to stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way because right now we're officially open. And hello, everyone. I'm your host, Darren Jaime. Today is Wednesday, November 28th, and you're watching Open, a live program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, as Open is now being broadcast live simultaneously on MNN's channel. Now, you can stay connected to us and find out more via Twitter at BronxNet TV and Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. Well, a lot has been going on throughout the past week and the holidays, but we're going to give you some events through our Bronx updates. And we're talking about a couple of events and New York City's favorite holiday tradition is back. Enchanting model trains zip through a display of more than 175 New York landmarks each recreated with bark leaves and other natural materials, all at the Botanical Garden. This year's exhibition showcases Lower Manhattan, the birthplace of New York City, featuring the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, and the iconic skyscrapers, sharing the spotlight among old and new favorites. The exhibit is happening until January 21st, 2019, and if you want more tickets, well, you can purchase them at www.nybg.org. And there is still a few days to register and join the Paige Frazier Foundation for the Intense Young Dance Program for dancers between the ages of 13 and 17 years old that live in the Bronx and Harlem. Now, if you want to apply, you go to www.thepagefrazierfoundation.org and you can become a part. And as the holiday season is now upon us, the Bronx Puerto Rican Day Parade, Lehman College, and the Lehman Life Program are inviting you to come on out and celebrate their end-of-the-year holiday benefit concert. This year's concert will feature performances by uh, Aya Della Cassell, Dancers Dreams, Los Hermanos Colon, Candela, and more. Now, in addition to the concert, the Bronx Puerto Rican Day Parade will present awards to their 2018 and 2019 honorees. And for more information, all you have to do is email masseventsnyc at gmail.com. And that's all for our Bronx updates and events. Our Bronx Net, uh, cameras, I should say, had the opportunity to go to the Bronx Chamber of Commerce luncheon. They were honoring six veterans at Maestro's Catering Hall. We're going to take a look at that right now. It's not only for me, but it's for all the veterans out there. Six veterans from the Bronx were honored at the Bronx Chamber of Commerce's Veterans Luncheon at Maestro's Catering Hall, among them Vice President of Property Management at Simone Development Company's Michael Borrero, who says his experience helped shape the person he is today. It paved the ground work for me to, to be successful in career. Um, the responsibilities, the loyalty, uh, the ability to, to you know, react in different situations, 
Um, it's, you know, made me grow up. And he's not alone. 29-year-old Sergeant Jenna Cole Quanlin, who also grew up in the Bronx, is an intelligent officer with the 10th Mountain Division, a National Guard counterpart. She served overseas in Iraq in support of Operation Inherent Resolve, and she's a police officer with the 44th Precinct. I only drill one week in a month and two weeks in the summer. Um, I was recently promoted while I was overseas in Iraq, so that was a surreal experience. Joe Fake knows all about serving others. He's a fourth generation war veteran from the Pelham section who served in Operation Desert Storm and Shield in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. Here he's training at Camp Lejeune in 1988 and here he is with his platoon overseas. You never get tired of hearing thank you but we all say the same thing. If we had to do it all over again we all would. I really would. I would do it again in a heartbeat. Might not be able to run as fast as I used to, but I would still do it. There were others known as an entrepreneur in the Bronx. Richard Naclario, who owns Maestro's Catering All, once served in the U.S. Army 7th Infantry in Korea. He talked about life once he returned to the Bronx. I was able to do and not only do charitable things, but I've also been very successful and I'm the owner of this facility. And, you know, and another one in the Bronx. I won't let the negative take that away from me, but I am one who was victimized in the military. And Carrie Taft, a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, says she experienced trauma while serving from 1979 to 83. Today she works alongside Johnny Williams from the Harlem base. Help is on the way to ensure vets get all the services they need. We may not see you, but do you hear us? We're coming. Help is on the way, like Johnny always says. Help is on the way. We make sure that uh, the, to the total family, we just don't do the veterans, and okay. it doesn't make a difference what that problem may be. We are here to solve that problem. And serving the U.S. Army from 1980 through 05 is retired citizen soldier Peter Del Debio, currently Bronx County's commander for all American Legion posts. He served in the New York City Police Department's Organized Crime Control Bureau and is a retired supervisor with the New York City Department of Sanitation. I want to give back for the great uh, career that I've had um, and my service. I want to give back to my fellow veterans and help them in any fashion I can. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't have the rights that we uh, enjoy today. This is a celebration for the service they've given us. Along with Barrero, the chamber works to successfully place veterans once they return. They say it's something that works to build a stronger Bronx. And we're very proud of them. We embrace them. We want them to know that we're here for them. And we will continue to support them you know, as they you know, enjoy their lives now in this free country that they're responsible for. Whether serving in the Korean War, Desert Storm, or any of the other wars, the message here from the Bronx Chamber of Commerce to all Bronx vets is thank you. For BronxNet, this is Arlene Makoko. And thank you, Arlene. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll come back with more Open right after this. I guess sometimes things just happen. Devastating things. Your whole world changes in an instant. That's what happened to me the day my mother had a stroke. I'm Paul George, and I want you to spot a stroke fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke fast. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment. A moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments. Goofy moments, sporty moments, dorky moments, kooky moments. Moments when we talk or walk or just hang out. It doesn't really matter. They all count because every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. So I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Behold the angry giant. 
Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Why don't you ever see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're really good at it. <laughs> yeah, I get it. And welcome back. The New York City Horror Film Festival is hosting its 16th annual edition from November 29th through December 2nd at Sinopolis Theater in Chelsea. Now, a film that's co-created by one of Bronx's very own is set to make its New York City appearance after premiering in Los Angeles earlier this year, winning awards and acclaim in multiple film festivals in the United States as well as across other countries. Well, we are pleased to welcome producer, actor, and Bronx Set program host, Javier E. Gomez, and director, producer, and actress, Luciana Fallhaber. And thank you so much for being with us. Good morning. Nice to see you. I have to say good morning. First of all, I'm, I'm, coming, I'm coming in this seat. <laughs> I usually see him in another capacity, and that's usually hosting Diago Alberto. And uh, here you are. I didn't know you had all this going on. Well, uh, most people don't know that I am actually, besides being a journalist and a program host, I am actually a trained actor. Mm -hmm. And I have always had parallel careers in journalism and communications and acting. A couple of years ago, uh, I decided to join forces with my school partner, mm -hmm. Luciana Falhaber, and uh, we decided to, after producing a couple of shows in New York and other ventures and a short film, to go into producing uh, a horror motion picture that was inspired by the films that we saw in our childhood growing up. And talk to us about this here. So you, you're taking horror, but you're putting a little twist to it. Right. We we wanted to move out of theater into film, and we're trying to decide um, what what was the genre that we wanted to try out. You know, and we did a short film before that that kind of range in the thriller area, and we really had a good time doing that. And we decided, you know what, let's do a feature. And people just kind of told us we couldn't. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, you guys are crazy. And we're like, all right, I guess we won't make it with you. Right. So we just kept on and on. And, and uh, you know, I was very lucky to meet Javier in school. And he saw the producer in me before anybody else did. Um, and he's been modest about a couple of years. I mean, we've been working together now almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a big fan of his work. So please, let's hear more about that. Right. <laughs> about Don't Look the Movie. Well, Don't Look, it's, uh, it's a new film inspired by the 1980s slasher uh, comedies. Mm -hmm. Those films that growing up in the 80s, we used to love to get together as a family or with friends and just to watch and laugh. The story is pretty simple and it's pretty traditional, but it does have some twists in terms of the role of women mm -hmm. and other minorities and, and how, how it breaks some of the molds in there. Luciana, as a director, I think has brought in a very unique vision to the genre, and I think that's why people are embracing the film so broadly these days. And you have a screening coming up on the 29th? Yes, we're very excited about it. It's going to be part of the New York City uh, Horror Film Festival, which is one of the biggest ones in the genre. Mm -hmm. We're so excited and proud that they included us in this year's programming. And uh, we're hoping to have a full house. So everybody, please come out and check us out. It's going to be great. What does it mean for you to be a part of the film festival? Uh, it means a lot, you know, like Javier mentioned, being part of a community at large is part of the reason that we make films. You know, we make films for an audience and we make films for a community, uh, not just ourselves. So th the fact that they embraced us in our work um, and they're really enjoying this throwback feel to it, it really means a lot to us. We did it in a, in a very, very kind of selfish way. Mm -hmm. We grew up watching, you know, those movies. I have an older sister and I would sneak in, like when my parents weren't looking, we'd hang out with her friends and watch those movies. And it has that vibe of like you know somebody peeking through a, you know a window or something trying to check it out mm -hmm. um, and that's what we wanted and you know the reception was way bigger and better than we expected we we yeah. have had a few different awards yeah, yeah talk about the embrace because it's been a huge embrace I mean you've won awards you've got people in the community who are saying listen this is something that we you know we like we see and you're inspiring people we have won uh, audience award in um, Brazil um, best uh, effects in Canada special award in Puerto Rico uh, 
we've got, I mean, yeah. like four, six uh, major awards. I think something that is resonating well with people is also the history of the project. It was, uh, we call it the little project that could. <laughs> it was uh, partially uh, crowdfunded in Kickstarter. More than 500 people donated to our campaign to make wow. it happen. Uh, most of the music selections that you will hear in the film were actually selected from uh, nominations that people, artists from around the world submitted their own work uh, when they responded to our call. So it's everyone coming together in a community mm -hmm. and, and contributing something to make this project happen. So it's everybody's triumph. So you want to check out the screening. It's taking place on November 29th, uh, and you can check it out. It's going to be part of the 16th anniversary of the New York Horror Film Festival. And uh, this year's festival has a very special kick to it. Uh, they're honoring African-American uh, filmmaker Tony Todd. What does that mean for you? I think for filmmakers at large, it means so much. You know, being a minority and a person of color, like Javier and I always try to, you know, strive for Latinos and our representation out there behind and in front of the screen. So being part of this 16th annual celebration, being, you know, producers of color, it means a lot to us. Something beautiful is also the importance of platforms like the Horror Film Festival in New York City that allows or facilitates emerging filmmakers like Luciana and I and others to stand side by side with Tony Todd and, and share and, and engage in a conversation and engage in a dialogue about moving forward and also opening doors up for people that are coming behind us. Mm -hmm. And you talk about crowdfunding, getting you started, helping you to get started, but talk to us about being an independent filmmaker, right? There's a lot of challenges that come with it. What were some of the biggest challenges for you looking back and saying, oh God, you know? <laughs> I mean, there were only challenges. <laughs> <laughs> Every day we were amazed this film was actually finished and made. Um, you know, starting a, kick, a crowdfunding Kickstarter, mm -hmm. that alone is a full-time job. Whenever people come to us and ask about advice on how to do it, we always say don't. <laughs> you know, find a different way. Um, you know, it's mostly your friends and family who donate, so maybe you don't need to go through a platform. You can find a way to do that directly. Um, and it becomes a full-time job. We were emailing people and, and messaging and texting and calling, you know, and by, by the end, you know, almost a full days, you know, and then mm -hmm. from there to not having enough money to make a feature because whatever we raised was not enough. We raised 50000 to make a, you know, a, an hour and 20 minute movie definitely is not enough. So, right. and now we have to like figure out ways to make that money and stretch it out, you know, as much as we could. Uh, and again, community really came on board. We shot in Pennsylvania. They were really generous with us. And then, you know, people bring pies and food. And, and we would need a generator. And they'd be like, oh, there's a guy down two farms away who has one we can borrow and things like that. So we screened there earlier this year. And, you know, the community support really is part of that project. And we're really proud of that. Um, and then, you know, we were first-time filmmakers. And that mm -hmm. comes with its own challenges. So we all, usually when you, as a director, when you're a first-time director, you surround yourself with people that know what they're doing and have that experience but unfortunately we didn't have that kind of a budget so we went out and searched for other emerging artists who also were hungry and needed to create something of their own but they also didn't know how to make a first-time feature so we all really learned together for that process I think the film taught us uh, reminded us of the best in humanity people do come together when there's need. Mm -hmm. And I think it also forced us to be very creative in thinking out mm -hmm. of the box mm -hmm. and thinking how can we get things done creatively. Like at some moment, we didn't have a, a lighting package. And people kept saying, you guys are shooting a horror film. Lights have to be perfect. And we used to scratch our heads and go like, oh, Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were able to get a grant from Ari. Mm -hmm. And with that came a very basic lighting package. And, and from there, we found some gentle souls in the Camden, Philadelphia area who actually rented us a fully loaded truck with the best lighting you can have for a horror picture for literally peanuts. Wow. Right. So it's, it's, it's a huge lesson about when you have a belief and a passion, pursue it, start it, get it work, and then the path shall, uh, the path shall open and reveal itself. Right. You, gotta just get, you just got to go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. ahead and do it. So November 29th, I want to invite you to come on out, 16th Annual. New York City Horror Film Festival. You can check out the movie there. And then after that, where do you go? Where do people catch up with you at? Well, we're having a pre-party because the screening's at 10 p.m., so we <laughs> want to make sure everybody is a Thursday. Everybody has time to go home and sleep before work. So we're having a party across the street starting at 8 p.m. at the Trailer Park Bar. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a deal. You can have a ticket. You get a free drink. Uh, and then <laughs> okay. come join us. All right. Well, we want you to come on out and do that. And thank you so much for coming. Thank to you, Darren. Great Congratulations to, be here. to you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Come we back hope and to see you there. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Listen, take a quick break. We've got more shows with us, uh, so stay with us. We're coming right back right after this. 
Chiru has no choice. She and millions like her walk miles a day for dirty water. But together, we can end their walk by providing clean water close by. Instead of spending hours walking to get water that makes them sick, girls can be in a classroom and moms will gain back time to care for their families. Sons and daughters can grow up strong, finally free of sicknesses. It's true. When you just add water, you change a life. Learn more at worldvision.org. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment. A moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments, goofy moments, sporty moments, dorky moments, kooky moments. Moments where we talk or walk or just hang out. It doesn't really matter. They all count because every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. Well, Thomas, you've got pre-diabetes. But with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. But I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so we're good? What? Oh, you still have pre-diabetes. Big time. Well, thank you for staying with us. We're talking about life insurance, and sometimes it's something that we, many people don't want to talk about, but what are some of the best ways to save on life insurance? And we got a few tips here. So we've got our financial expert, Jonathan Ortiz, who comes and joins us today. And, uh, good to have you. Thank you, Darren, like always. A pleasure to be here and talk to the community um, about the opportunities they have. Right. Um, f f first things first, life insurance, it's something that no one wants to talk about. Right. The average person, you talk to them about life insurance, and they think, I'm going to die, this one's gonna die. Um, and no one likes to think about that. No one likes to think about the, you know, the possibilities that will happen in your life. Um, and I tell people who, have, uh, you know, who come to me with those problems, the first thing that I tell them is this. Is there someone in your life that you love? Are there things in your life that are important that will need to be taken care of even if you're not here? Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing when you're looking at, li at a life insurance policy is assessing your current situation, right? Who do you owe money to? Do you have student loans? Do you have this? Do you have that? Some people would argue, why would I care? I'm not here anymore. I would say if you have a mortgage, if you have a house, if you have properties, you need life insurance because those that you know will, you, leave, you will leave will be affected by your loss. Right. So um, how much money do you need? You know, It will depend on your lifestyle. It will depend on who you owe money to um, and the different assets you have or might not have. Uh, the, the next thing I would like to talk about, and in particular uh, when it comes to life insurance, is do you get whole life or do you get term life? That's probably the number one question when you go online, what type of insurance do I get? Well, what's the difference between whole life and term life? Whole life means your entire life. That means you're going to pay a premium, a monthly premium for the rest of your life unless you choose to pay it sooner. 
you might make uh, payments ahead of time, and instead of taking your whole life to pay them, you might be able to pay it in 10 years instead of your entire life in annuity. Mm -hmm. All right, so if you choose term life, that means that you're only choosing life insurance for a period of time, it's a temporary insurance. So like, let's just say you choose, you know, I'm 30 years old and I only think I'm gonna need, uh, you know, to get life insurance for the next 20 years, I'll get life insurance for the next 20 years. Usually, term life insurance is cheaper than whole life. Mm -hmm. You could understand why, because you're only doing it for a portion of your life, not for your entire life. At the end of the term insurance, you usually have the option to increase and either turn it into a whole life or increase the term. Uh, for another 10 years, 20 years, but as you will, you know, as, as those in the industry know, a lot of times the value, uh, the, the amount of money you're going to have to end up paying is probably two, three times what you're paying right now for term life. Yeah. And I came with some tips today, so I want to talk about some of the tips that we have uh, that you know about life insurance. And so uh, let's look at tip number one. And mm -hmm. uh, tip number one, I think you say, look into your employer benefits. Absolutely. A, a lot of people say, hey, listen, I don't have enough money. I don't, I don't have enough to pay for life insurance. And I tell them, listen, the first thing you should do is look at your employer. What does your employer have to offer? A lot of times your employer offers low or free uh, life insurance options that are, they, just, they give it to you just because you have a job. Same things with some universities, some schools, they make that part of your package and it, they're included there already. All right. Number two, you say buy young. Absolutely. The younger, the healthier you are. I tell people that the younger you are, the lower the premiums are going to be. So you should have it. A lot of times we don't buy them, especially at our young age. All of a sudden something happens and you're not, you know, you're not, you know, you're not secured. And that could be a, a problem. Mm -hmm. Number three, buy enough to cover a few years of expenses. Absolutely. The same way, you know, you know, you might not be here tomorrow. The same, your expenses might still be there for your wife, for your spouse, for your significant other, for your mom, for your dad, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you should, you know, when you're looking at your budget in terms of how much money you should buy in life insurance, you should think about not just now or next month, think about, or just the bureau expenses, but think two, three years ahead of time. How will this affect my significant other with that loss? Mm. Number four, you buy insurance for the young ones as well. Buy insurance for the young ones. Uh, listen, we have kids. We all have kids. They're in school. They're out there. We hear about all these accidents happen, school buses, this, that happens. You don't want something to happen. Imagine dealing with that loss and then dealing with the fact that you need to come up with the money to pay for their expenses as well. And having that conversation, that's big. Talking to family. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Family comes first. You need to talk to those who are closest to you about your decision to buy the life insurance. They need to know who's in it, who's not in it, so that when the day comes that this needs to be executed, you will have a game plan in place. And term and whole, of course, it depends on what the goals are. Absolutely. So again, if, 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 you know, if you're younger, I say go, go with term. And you know, if, if you're older, try to go with whole. It really depends on your situation. Not, it's, it's not a one size fits all. It's really what works for your life. But when you talk about families, you know, sometimes it's a hard conversation to have, right? And so when you come across the people that you deal with, how often is it a lot of resistance to even talking about the whole issue of life insurance? Well, it, it, you know, death is something difficult to, you know, to speak about. I think a lot of people think, well, you know, you know, especially Latinos, especially in our black communities, we don't talk about it because we're like, oh, well, we, we already have a plot of land in our home, our hometown, our homeland. You know, they don't, they don't talk about these little things. Oh, it's a monthly plan. A lot of people don't want to chip in, especially for the elderly, because usually our parents are much older than us, and they don't leave us with an inheritance, unfortunately, especially in low-income neighborhoods. They leave us with debt. So what ends up happening is that, you know, you have two or three brothers. They don't want to help chip in, chip in for this, you know, for this life insurance policy. Something happens. You know, that's usually the problem. Can you afford it? Mm -hmm. You know, and I tell people the reason why you should go, you know, look into it while they're younger is so that you will be able to afford it. I'm gonna switch gears for a minute. Just coming out of Black Friday and uh, you know the whole the whole holiday shopping thing. What are you hearing on your end financially? Was a lot of spending going on? Oh man, uh, especially Cyber Monday. <laughs> Cyber Monday was the uh, the number one day in sales in the in the history of the economy, basically, uh, when it comes to online spending. So it, it, it went phenomenal for all of those who were selling things that day. Yeah, absolutely. If those who are spending. We'll find out a little later on. Absolutely, huh? we, will. we I will. I will find out in January. <laughs> when, it, <laughs> when it comes to your desk, right? Absolutely. So give us a, a couple of tips right now before we leave. Once again, talking about life insurance, uh, I guess the best thing is you got to shop around too, right? 
I think you should shop around, go around, look at different brokers. Don't just go with the, you know, with the person in your neighborhood. Um, another thing is look look into your uh, into different community organizations that might have information mm -hmm. and might be able to, you know, push you in a certain direction for you to look at your options at, you know, from a better point of view. Another thing is, uh, for instance, on Saturday there's an economic forum going on in the Bronx, and I would say you should definitely, you know, partake in these discussions and go talk to different community stakeholders because sometimes those people have the answers you might need. All right, Jonathan Ortiz, our finance expert. Thank you so much for coming Thank and sharing you. with us. Thank you, Good to have it, Jonathan Ortiz. Listen, take a quick break. We've got more show. Stay with us. We'll come right back right after this. Open up your books to page 360. Did you just look at your phone while you was in class? You played yourself. Talking about inspirational quotes. You got to believe in yourself. Don't ever play yourself. The key is to make it, so make it. Louise. Louise. Can you give me an example of an inspirational quote? Don't play yourself. The key is to make it. And who said that? I did. Now that's a major key alert. Learn the real major keys to getting to college at GetSchool.com. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the in the same place, and then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket, again. It's like, hello, that's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Well, Thomas, you've got pre-diabetes, but with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising, it, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're good? What? Oh, you still have prediabetes. Big time. Patriotism. It inspires passionate debate. It's worn like a badge of honor with good reason, because it means love and devotion for one's country. But what really makes up this country of ours? It's the people. To love America is to love all Americans. This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love, love beyond age, sexuality, disability, race, religion, and other labels. Because love has no labels. You think getting dumped by text is harsh? Try getting dumped by a tennis ball. My ex-owner drove me out to the woods, yelled fetch, and by the time I bought the ball back, he was gone. Yeah, I was pissed. <laughs> but the folks at the shelter helped me let go of my anger. I learned coping skills, like taking it to the hole. Boom! Now I'm ready to fetch again. But how about I throw and you run and get it? And we're back. Bronx Bail Fund reports after posting bail. Many Bronxites are still detained at Rockers Island long after having their bail posted. Also, Melissa Mark Viverito announced run for New York City public advocate. What does this all mean? And joining us via phone call to discuss this, we welcome now the associate editorial page editor of the New York Post, Michael Benjamin, to join us. And uh, Mike, good to have you. Morning, Darren. How are you? I'm doing well. As we start things off, let's talk about uh, Melissa Bark Viverito, former speaker, uh, now throwing her hat into the ring, saying that she will run for uh, public advocate. This uh, taking place, of course, after Tish James now goes to the New York State Attorney General's seat. But you also got a couple of candidates out there, uh, Jamani Williams, Mike Blake, right here in our area. Uh, what does Melissa Mark Viverito adding her name to the ring mean? Uh, can you hear me? Michael, we have you? It just went out. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you right now. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I hear you right now. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know. Uh, Melissa Margarito, she brings her experience as a, as a member of the city council, the former city council speaker. And as she said in, in her announcement, she's also a woman. Uh, she's a Latina. And uh, right now, and in her words, uh, the, the top three officials in New York City are all uh, white men. And uh, she wants to, I uh, guess, break that, that 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 current glass ceiling and, and bring uh, women to the to the conversation as well as bring a Latina to a uh, position as a 
as a citywide elected official. As Trump speaker, she had a citywide role, but she was not elected citywide. So that would be her opportunity. I believe she currently she'd be the, the only the only uh, female Latino uh, running uh, for public advocate. Egg, what do you say for her chances? Uh, I think you no, know, they've all got an equal chance. Uh, Jamani Williams has a leg up on because he ran statewide. Uh, uh, this this year, and he put, rolled up some pretty big numbers in the city, particularly in his home borough of Brooklyn. So I think he goes in as the prohibitive favorite. Um, Marito comes in as, as Latina, a woman, so she has possibly that. Uh, but you've got Latrice Walker from Brooklyn, a member of the state assembly and attorney who announced her run for public advocate. As you said, Michael Blake, an assemblyman from the Bronx, who's uh, getting better known. Uh, you have um, from Brooklyn another council member, um, Espinal. Um, possibly Republicans might run. Uh, Joe Borelli from Staten Island has talked about it. Um, you have Eric Ulrich from Queens, a Republican. He's talked about possibly running. But if a Republican were to run and maybe try to take advantage of a split in a Democratic vote, you know, they would only be you know public advocate for a, a couple of months before the general election, and then they'd probably lose in a general election landscape to a Democratic uh, candidate. So you know, we'll see what people decide to do. Uh, with their careers right now, it's sort of sort of a free run uh, to run for public advocate. They now have a couple of uh, months uh, to raise money and raise their profile, and to get on the ballot for what will probably be an end of mid February, end of February uh, special election. Yeah, given the fact that the mayor's uh, under uh, scrutiny right now, talking about that twenty million dollars that's out there. Uh, in excessive spending uh, on travel trips that was uh, that came out by way of an audit, uh, a public advocate, of course, certainly would be the person that speaks to that. Uh, bring us the latest on well, that. Well, the, well, the, well, yeah, that too. But but you're also that report was audited by the city controller, whose role is to do that sort of thing and to look at city spending and to point out where you know where certain rules have been broken. And uh, in this case, uh, controller Scott Stringer, his staff discovered. That DOE staffers were, uh, you know, going on, on on these on these making these travel arrangements, travel plans, and spending city money, board of education money, uh, without going through the, the proper protocol, and you know, and you know that that kind of spending, you know, is unwarranted and, and makes you mistrust the mayor when he talks about wanting to expand, uh, you know, mayoral control of the Department of Education when he can't even control you know, excessive spending by the people who are responsible to him and to Chancellor uh, Carranza. Yeah, and I, I was saying the public advocate, of course, would be a voice in that, uh, you know, saying, you know, really speaking up and advocating for the people, uh, given the fact that you have this much money that's out there with regards to uh, ex excessive travel. Uh, what are we looking by way of criminal charges? Well, I don't know if it's going to rise to the level of, of criminal charges. I don't, think I don't think any particular criminality is involved other than nothing criminal. I don't think anything is a misdemeanor unless, unless that's discovered. But the controlled report didn't point to any uh, criminal activities. It's just a violation of established, you know, financial protocols when it comes to how to spend travel money, and in most cases, are trying to avoid using conference centers and expensive hotels when you could possibly use schools that charge a small fee or schools that are open and offer free space. Mm. Let's bring a little closer. That's to needed. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, let's bring, okay, a little, I'll bring it a little bit closer to home. Talk a little bit about uh, Rikers Island. I started my lead with Rikers Island, finding people who are still paying bail or still having a long time uh, in the system. Talk to us about that. Well, what we're finding is, you know, you have the, uh, the Bronx Bail Fund, which is, which is a bail fund to bail out people from Rikers up to $2,000 uh, bail. Uh, they're finding, despite their ability to raise bail for, for these uh, arrestees, they're finding that the process takes a long time. You know, we noticed that when, when we saw the, uh, Rock, the, uh, not the, Rock, the uh, Robert F. Kennedy Fund, they tried, they have a current bail plan to bail out women and young people from, uh, from, from city jail, and they're finding it's been, a, been slow going in getting those people uh, released. But New York Post reporting has found that a couple of the people who they've been successful in getting bail and releasing, um, two or three of them, um, skip the court, skip the court date, and are now uh, you know uh, have warrants out because they skipped the court date. So that's that's problematic. But what I think the uh, Bronx Bail Fund points out that we really do need significant bail reform, reforming cash bail, and then also reforming the process of getting it done. A lot of times, unless you pay your bail at your judicial hearing, at your court hearing, 
uh, once you go to Rikers, it's a, it's a long process to get the bail money, get, get to the process, put up the bail, and then to find the inmate and then to bring the inmate, you know, and release that inmate. And the bail fund, I think, is an important report. I think something that the legislature and the city council needs to look at to find out ways of, of improving the system and getting people released in, in, on a timely process. You know, whether a person is, you know, everybody who's arrested is uh, presumed innocent until they're found guilty at trial. Um, so I think arrestees can be considered innocent until proven guilty and then given reasonable bail mm-hmm. to get out. A bail is not used, you know, to be preemptive to prevent people from coming out, from being released back onto the streets unless, you know, and, it, they, and it's not even because they pose a danger. A judge legally cannot, cannot say a person cannot be released because they pose a danger. Mm-hmm. Yes, there have to be other reasons for setting bail and setting a higher bail as a way of maybe not letting us, let's say, an El Chapo, you know, uh, uh-huh. a, a major drug dealer from running around back in the back in the boroughs. Right. Before I let you go, I want to ask your question. Well, ask, get your thoughts, I should say, on the passing of uh, New York State Senator Jose Peralta, uh-huh. di- uh, dead at the age of 47, a surprising uh, death that came and uh, really shook Albany and New York State. Yeah, Jose was a... Was a uh, both in the assembly and, and when I when I left, I stayed in touch with him. In fact, I spoke with him prior to the September Democratic primary that he wound up losing. Um, he, he was a good man, uh, young at young at 47. I feel badly for his wife and, and, and his two surviving children. And he was a family man. And to lose your your father, your husband at such a young age is, is really tragic. Uh, what I'm hoping that uh, the New York State Legislature will do is, since he was a champion of the New York State Dream Act and allowing dreamers Young people who were brought here by their parents are undocumented, but live their entire lives in the United States, in New York City, New York State, and are good students and, and are attending colleges in, in New York. For them to be eligible for state and city college financial assistance, um, it, it's me. It, 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 it would be the right thing to do. And if they should rename the bill the Jose per, Jose Peralta Dream Act, and so that when it's passed by the Assembly and the Senate, as we expect it to happen sometime next year, that his work will be memorialized through that act. Mm, pretty interesting. I hope we'll see how that, we'll see, and we'll definitely follow that, uh, the death of Jose Peralta, whether or not that actually comes to uh, fruition. Mike Benjamin, as always, thank you, my brother. Good to have you here uh, sharing a little bit about what is going on in the world of politics. Always good, Dan. Darren. Thank you. All right, now. Taking a quick break. Be back with more show. Be right back in a few. Sometimes things just happen. Devastating things. Your whole world changes in an instant. That's what happened to me the day my mother had a stroke. I'm Paul George, and I want you to spot a stroke fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke fast. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund reading. No. <laughs> Let me try. Sarah's bright, but when she's reading, she has trouble sounding out words. Playing world music. What? I give up. Wait, I was trying to show you how Sarah feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive. I'm only 17, but I know about investing. Believe in something, buy shares in it, watch it grow. So what if you could invest in the future? The future of kids, like a stock. Not the kind of stock that's about making money, but a stock for social change. A whole new kind of investment called Better Futures. When you invest, 
it helps kids go to college. I could be one of the first college graduates from my family, the first philanthropist from my neighborhood. And if I'm the first, then maybe there's a second and a third. Believe in us, invest in us, watch us grow. My name is Sydney and I'm your dividend. And we are back. The New York City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce announces the 13th annual Hispanic Business Awards Banquet and Scholarship Ceremony. It's taking place this coming Friday, an event honoring successful individuals who've proven their commitment to upholding the integrity of the Hispanic community. Joining us is Suma Arzu Brown, who is the Director of Operations for the New York City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and she joins us here. Good to have you back. Oh, it's always good to come home to Bronxnet. I love this place. Ah, we love you, too. Yeah. Love you, too. It's so very special day coming up. Yeah, it's going to be incredible. It's this Friday. It's our annual and biggest fundraiser event of the <laughs> year, and we take that opportunity to recognize outstanding Hispanic business leaders, uh, not just business leaders, but have also be a, a standout a human being and even their personal lives, uh, family lives, and also take the time out to give back to the next generation of leaders, uh, which uh, leads me to the next point, which is the scholarship awards that we give to Latino students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you got some scholarship awards and yeah. talk to us about those. Well, you know, it's important for us as a chamber to pretty much get our, our members together and, and corporate members together to say, listen, you know, uh, we want to make sure that our young people are educated so that you're able to keep the doors of opportunities open for them. So partner with us and let's scholar some of this youth. We work with uh, a lot of the CUNY institutions and schools here uh, in New York. Uh, also. Uh, Berkeley College, but uh, it, it's via an essay uh, competition. We really want to know why it is that you need the scholarship award uh, for, and more importantly for us is when you graduate, how do you plan to give back to the Hispanic community? What contribution are you going to, to make to continue to, to make us grow and thrive? So we're going to be uh, scholaring for young, uh, young Latino leaders this year. We're very excited. Colgate Palmolive gave a scholarship, the New York Yankees, and and uh, we also have uh, our executive director is giving the Henry Estrada mm -hmm. uh, Scholarship Award for the very first time in honor of her late husband who believed in, in the next generation. So we utilize, uh, you know, all, all of these individuals to, to pretty much support them in, in their support of young leaders. Right. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about businesses, obviously, mm -hmm. it's a small business is the, the, the lifeblood of, mm -hmm. you know, what we do. Talk us to... When you talk about business and connection with the Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. how are you finding the Hispanic mm -hmm. Chamber being able to tap into business? Has it been easy? Has it been hard? How's it been? You know, you know what it is? I think that uh, for us, it's all about networking with one another. I think that it's important for us to bring together a collective and diverse group of business owners. We have from mom and pop shops to entrepreneurs to mid-level businesses, small and Fortune 500 businesses as part uh, of our chamber, right? Because we can all learn from one another, what type of business opportunities are available, and, and you know what kind of contracts can, can can be awarded to a small business from, say, uh, a Colgate Palmolive or, or an MSG. How do we? How can we work and collaborate and do business mm -hmm. together? So the chamber really gives each and every one of us that opportunity. And I think what I'm proudest of is that is is it's not that type of chamber that you know that you have to be. Uh, 
ex you, you, you have to be extremely, like, very professional. Like, we want you to come with your business experience, but we also want you to come as a human being because we work on integrity mm -hmm. and we build the relationships on behalf of our mem members. So we want to make sure that we connect and mesh the right people together because at the end of the day, you're going to tell the story of how you went to this incredible chamber networking event opportunity mm -hmm. and, and because of us, your business grew. You know, so it's very important uh, for us to, to go through all forms of business and support each business. When you have business owners together and you have mm -hmm. small business together, mm -hmm. uh, gathering together, what are some of the common challenges that we're hearing today? A lot of the common challenges that we're hearing today from business owners are uh, displacement. Mm -hmm. uh, that's real. Uh, yeah, that's real. It's happening. We also have... Um, uh, the MWBEs and how to to make sure that they get the right opportunity to do business safer for, for government contracts. So how do we facilitate uh, those opportunities for them? We work very closely uh, with, with the MTA as well uh, and their mentorship program to make sure that uh, you know that that our small businesses, black and brown businesses, are are being counted and get the opportunity and and and, and the resources that they need mm -hmm. uh, to to grow and thrive. So we're we're hearing that. So we're going to be tackling that uh, for 2019. We're also we're also seeing that even in the corporate environments that they are now big on diversity and inclusion. And you have the ERG, which are the employment resource groups. Some um, know it as um, BRGs, business resource groups. So you get these affinity groups at the, uh, with the blacks, Latinos, LGBTQ, and they're trying to really you know bring together a culture within business. So the New York City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce uh, will definitely be going on that road again to make sure that the doors of opportunities remain open for the new ma majority, mm -hmm. uh, the black and Latinos. Right. Well, I'll let you know also <laughs> November 30th is the day. You can come on out between 6, the event starts at 6, uh, at Maestro's Caterers and uh, mm -hmm. Hispanic Chamber uh, Business Awards Banquet and Scholarship Ceremony uh, mm -hmm. that is honoring. Now, also, wanna let you, we mm -hmm. want to let you know not just talk about that, but also on Friday. Yeah. You got something going on. Yeah, so so Friday is the Business Banquet and Scholarship Award. We're going to be recognizing uh, Mari, uh, Marisol Castro, which happens to be the uh, the first PA announcer for Major League Baseball. We're going to be honoring Limari's um, Arbols from Acacia, Plinio Ayala, the president uh, and executive director of Per Scolas, uh, Carlos Nadung from, uh, from Ponce Bank, and Marcelo Velas uh, from uh, the Manhattanville Project at Columbia University. University. That's happening on Friday, so we're super excited uh, to be recognizing them. And on Saturday, mm -hmm. uh, we believe that you were talking earlier about uh, financial empowerment. Right. So we're partnering with Master Your Card Oportunidad. I uh, now have the um, the privilege of sitting on their board of advisors. So we're bringing more financial literacy uh, to families and engaging. Uh, uh, the community. For example, we're partnering with Phipps Neighborhood, mm -hmm. and uh, they're going to invite as many people as possible with the Fatherhood um, uh, Initiative Film Festival, which which pretty much brings together in a very creative way both, both fathers and children to build a stronger uh, relationship uh, with them. So that's very important. We're going to have catering by, by Daniel Garcia of Salsa Caterers, mm -hmm. and of course, the Boogie Down Grind will have their amazing coffee and pastries there. But the most important thing is um, we just pl passed Black Friday, mm -hmm. uh, Cyber Monday, Tuesday, all this, all this stuff. But, you know, not everyone is educating us about how to manage right. that money effectively. So you're going to hear a lot of that. And, and I think that it's important to get your family and children is starting to uh, have this conversation really early. And, and we figure, why not do it, you know, because there's right. another round of Christmas shopping that are going to happen. It's getting ready to happen, so, right. And we're also going to be giving $50 gift cards, MasterCard gift cards, to the first 100 people to get you started on how you're going to manage this $50 effectively. Wow, so you get $50, <laughs> you're going to get to learn how to manage it really yeah. good. All right. <laughs> That's a good enough reason to come on out right there. You're going to get your 50 and you're going to learn how to manage your 50 yeah. real good. For people who want to join the Hispanic <laughs> Chamber of Commerce, what is uh, the qualifications? The qualifications is, uh, do you have to be a Spanish-owned business? No, you don't. You know, you, you can be a Spanish business. You can be an entrepreneur. But if your market is the Hispanic market, I think that it, it's very wise to have a liaison like the Hisp New York City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, to be on your side and, and pretty much introduce you to our market 
in a in, in a nice way. You know, we don't we don't believe in takeovers. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, there's a good way to do things and there's a not so good way uh, to do things. It's, it's very simple. You just go to hispanicchamber.nyc and you see what membership uh, best suits you. You know, we believe in the honor system and we just want you uh, to be honest with the amount of employees that you have and again choose the membership that um, that you believe is best uh, for your business and and get ready to, and get ready to work the network. You right. know, we work together and be ready. We love engaged members. We have a member uh, we recognize, Miss Eileen Guzzo. She became the IT chairperson and now she's part of our board of directors. So we 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 love extremely engaged members. Um, it's the only way to work and it's, it's great business practice. It's you know and it's it's the lifeblood. You know, yeah. and, and we need mm -hmm. to be connected. So yeah. I want people to come on out, get connected. They got a bunch of events. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you talked about Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Listen, everything. And then you got 2019 coming around the corner. Real quick, what do you got? What do you got around, coming on on 2019? Well, you know, we do believe in financial empowerment, so we're actually going to be partnering with J.P. Morgan Chase as they launch their Entrepreneurs of Color funds, and that's going to be to support uh, small uh, businesses, mm -hmm. and they're going to start right here in the Bronx. So we're going to dive right into that uh, for January, February, and you'll be hearing more about us. We're super excited for the upcoming year. Good. So mm -hmm. if people want to get in contact with you, mm -hmm. what do they do? HispanicChamber.nyc, and my name is Sulma. It's uh, Sulma at nychcc.com. There it is. Mm -hmm. All righty. Thank you so much for coming and no, being with us. It's always great to be here with you. Come on again, You're awesome. all right? You know, you know, Sulma's here with us. Listen, mm -hmm. unfortunately, we've come to the end of our show today. Got to thank all of our guests for joining us. Most of all, I want to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, yes, you can catch the Recablecast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Optimum's Channel 67. If you have Verizon Files, of course, that's 33, or watch us anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. And once again, a special shout-out to all those watching on the MNN channel to watch open as it's broadcast live simultaneously on MNN. Listen, that's all the time we have for here. Darren Jaime saying, take care, keep your heart, your mind, but most of all, this channel wide open. make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. I love it. Cross-referencing travel sites and booking all your flights with those... Vouchers. I got us bumped. They were like, oh, But now they're like... <laughs> Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Behold. The angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund reading. No. <laughs> Let me try. Sarah's bright, but when she's reading, she has trouble sounding out words. Playing world music. What? I give up. Wait, I was trying to show you how Sarah feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive.